The NFL Combine has come and gone. What's up, IBT family? Tonight, we break down our winners and losers from an exciting weekend out in Indianapolis. All this and more, it's the IBT podcast coming right at you. Because I've been in tune, out of touch, coming off the bench, trying to shake the funk, check your stat line, see who's up, that over, under, hit too clutch. And I'm trying to avoid getting carried away with the jet sweet, sleeping on a trick play, predicting all of my moves like they seen every play, and so I'm running it back, head down, get out of my way, and it's for the law with only one thing to do, I guess I'll say a prayer and put it all on the line for you with they all. Just one thing to say, yeah, what they don't know, something they haven't seen, I'm off that mean Joe Green, it got me fading between, yeah, I got it, and I got it. The In-Between Fantasy Football Podcast. All right, all right, all right. It is Tuesday, March 5th, 2024, and it's the NFL offseason. However, it did not feel like it this weekend with a buzz that was palpable in the air out in Indianapolis for the NFL Combine. We'll certainly chat all about it and what it means for you, the fantasy football manager, tonight. My name is Seth Wilcock, and I'm grateful to lead this program each and every single week the last few years, and we haven't been canceled yet, so uh, thank you, uh, grateful for that. And uh, part of that is thanks to this man here on my left, your right. Uh, he, he's a two-time award-nominated analyst, a raging Washington Huskies fan, and yes, my friend Scott right here. Scott, how are we doing today post-NFL Combine? We're good, man. Another, another off-season milestone. Yeah. I mean, come and gone. Another day of just overreaction and excitement um, came and went. But no, I mean, the way I kind of look at it, I'm a big spreadsheet guy. And like, as soon as the data becomes available through the sources I use, I start filling these prospect spreadsheets. And, you know, there's a bunch of columns that don't get filled until just this past weekend. So it's super exciting. Um, it's really fun, you know. And, and I mean, this combine in particular was kind of full of fireworks especially from Absolutely. the receivers. Um, it was just a lot of fun. You know, you got to take it with a grain of salt and, you know, factor in more than just the combine. But just as a football event in the offseason, it was, it was a lot of fun. I'm 100% there with you, man. I, I thought it was a blast uh, with everything going on at the NFL Combine this past weekend. And uh, excited to get your numbers and your data here later on in the program. We're also joined by a gentleman who's slowly become a permanent fixture on our program. Uh, a, a guy who the YouTube comments absolutely are taking some shots at lately. Uh, but he's still QB1. He's still looking like a fucking GQ model out here. Changed up the hair. He's Hoove, a.k.a. The man, the Gooch Cheese founder. What's up, Hoov? Did you guys know that Taylor Swift's best friend, Donna Kelsey's son's brother, retired today? I did. I did. That's crazy. Yesterday. Came across my notice my, today. My notifications. So yeah, I just wanted to give a little shout out to Jason Kelsey. You know, <laughs> shout out. Yes. But it's your boy Hoop. Let's get it going. Let's get it popping. Let's get it talking about these quarterbacks as QB1. I'm on a hot streak. As soon as I start talking about a QB prospect, all of a sudden, zoom, and 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 they're right up the rankings. All right, so I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's go, man. I I have to thank the NFL Combine because I didn't have a great weekend in the betting scene for NASCAR and the PGA Tour. However, the NFL Combine, we were able to cash some tickets. So next year, we're going to do a full preview. We, I don't even know there are NFL Combine props available to me in Pennsylvania. So I, I was thankful for that. I, I'm with you, Hoove. I'm ready to go tonight on the show. As you alluded to, we're going to talk Combine winners and losers in rave rookie reviews. We're also going to talk about March releases to look forward to in the music, in, in the, the movie and the tv realm what will we have our eye on here in march as the seasons turn and then we'll get you from the forum sponsored by the fantasy football advice network we're going to take your questions both here in the chat and over on the fantasy football advice network 
We're also joined by the IBT family tonight and I have to thank everyone so much for all the support lately. Uh, it, two, last month was one of our biggest months uh, on the channel to date. So we're very, very thankful for that. Uh, everyone who likes, subscribes and, and hangs out with us here live every Tuesday evening at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. We appreciate you guys. And who we still got draft night out tickets. They're rolling and rolling and rolling off the shelves. They're going quick, my friend. Uh, but I'm excited to hang out with some people in Canton in a couple months and uh, get a little boozed up and, and do some drafts. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. I'm pumped. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to go get have Scott buy me some Starbucks in the morning after a good old hangover. So, yeah, Scott. I'm Scott was absolutely clutch last year with, with doing a couple of runs when we need some uh, some calories and some some coffee in us. I was uh, slinging, I was slinging egg, egg McMuffins outside of the outside of the event. I know. I, I bought a bunch and I couldn't bring them inside. I didn't know that. Katie had to smuggle one in for me. I got it. Don't you worry, <laughs> buddy. Don't you worry. I needed it too. You know that was really fun though because that's what a better way to meet somebody you haven't met than like you know trade hey. some trade some shop talk over a egg McMuffin. There you sure. go. There you go. We got Albert in the chat. Good evening, IBT. What's up, Albert? Good to see you, man. Hope you enjoyed the NFL Combine weekend. And then we got Didi saying hello. Hello, my handsome boys. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to you, Didi. Hope you're having a great one out there in California as well. Um, guys, let's go ahead, though. Let's, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into our NFL Combine winners and losers. And then we'll touch on some uh, March releases we're looking forward to as well. All in rave rookie reviews. It was quite the weekend out in Indianapolis. We didn't get all the top quarterback prospects, but we did get a lot of the good ones still in there. And uh, for me, there are two definite NFL combined winners at the quarterback position. The first is our guy who we thought could potentially be a winner going into the weekend. Who and I, we were kind of at a stance with our other co-host, not here tonight, Eric. Um, but it was J.J. McCarthy weighing in at 219 pounds. That's 17 pounds heavier than what he was listed at Michigan this past year. There are rumors going around. This guy's a little lanky, uh, you know, kind of looking like Bryce Young out there. Panic alarms were going off. Um, it looks like he sealed the deal on the scales. He's been in the gym working good for J.J. McCarthy. And then, Scott, your guy, Michael Penix Jr., also a winner on the list. I was dead wrong. I got a little bit of cake on my face because I figured older prospect – Going in there with some injury history, he could, you know, be a faller. He was not at all. Not so fast, my friends, kind of like Lou Holtz would say. Um, Michael Penix Jr., man, like, comes out, and when he was slinging the ball, is there anything that looks better than a, a Michael Penix spiral dude? Like, he was absolutely shredding it compared to everyone out there, Scott. Oh, yeah, man, I got to watch that all year. I mean, I, one thing I'm going to miss so much is the back shoulder throw from Penix to Rama Dunze. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, it, it just, Adunze really didn't have to have the type of separation you normally would have to have to be considered open to be open because mm -hmm. of, because of Penix. So yeah, I was obviously very happy to see him, um, have an excellent combine. Um, I'm super intrigued to see where and how high he goes. We'll see. Yeah, and, and Hoove, even more importantly for Michael Penix Jr., according to Jordan Schultz, he had, quote, great interviews and clear medicals. Does this put Penix back in that first-round conversation? Because I feel like he was kind of sliding into a day-two pick. Um, but now, could he be back in that day one? Will he be in uh, Hoove's mock draft 3.0 coming out here in the next couple weeks? I think that he has an opportunity to make it up. But it's more the fact that we'll talk about it later there's at least 45 prospects that could go in the first round. So like, am I going to take a shot on Michael Penix? Like, does he deserve to be in that category? Absolutely. But will he, I guess we're going to have to find out on 3.0 once okay. you guys check that out when we get there. Okay. Okay. What about JJ McCarthy? Who does he move up into the top 10 here weighing in like he did? 
didn't look perfect in the throwing. There were some incompletions, but it's combined throwing. You can't really put too much into the overall result of the pass. We we can categorize him as a winner because in the eyes of the people, everyone's now realizing how good J.J. McCarthy is. But you look back on our December 26th episode, we just posted on an X uh, highlight where I was talking about, I think J.J. McCarthy's in this category with the big boys. They should be up there in the top three, top four category. So now that everyone's starting to get on board with J.J. McCarthy, we'll categorize him as a winner. But overall this weekend, he didn't show me anything that he didn't already show me before. So he's kind of a neutral pick for me. But now knowing the teams that that who are like what teams are looking for, whether it's Kirk Cousins going to the Falcons at eight, you know, or instead of them going for a quarterback at eight, they're going after Kirk Cousins or possibly the Raiders. Yeah. Instead of them trading up, they could go after Russell Wilson or just multiple of things. Uh, even we're hearing the Vikings and the Giants are both now really liking JJ McCarthy. So those are two teams that I could see them trading up. But once again, it all comes down to opportunity. And if a team like the Chargers don't want to trade down or the Cardinals don't want to trade down from grabbing a Marvin Harrison Jr. if he's available, then mm-hmm. – the Giants might end up just grabbing JJ McCarthy at six just because like he's there, you know, and no one, no one could trade up over him. And, and Scott, you got to love he, him coming in at 219 pounds. He's only 21 year, years old. And like, I can attest from experience, Scott, like, dude, I, I was as skinny as a rail still at 21. And by 23, I was a completely different body type. I felt like. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it takes a lot. I mean, I used to be very much into athletics. Um, I still try, but it's it's a little tougher these days. Um, but no, it's it's not um, it's not easy to put on that amount of weight, basically all muscle. Yeah. Um, in that amount of time, I mean, you know, sometimes the 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 numbers that are given to us by the actual schools themselves aren't necessarily to be trusted. But regardless of that, I mean, boy, put on some weight. Um, you know, and I mean, more power to him because that was a knock you know, coming mm-hmm. into it. So, I mean, he, he, you know, he probably used that as, as fuel, just, just like I think Pen- Penix losing that national championship game. I think it probably, he, one of the more, more competitive guys I've ever seen, um, probably lit a fire under him to, you know, to show out of the combine as much as possible. Absolutely. We got Rachel in the chat saying IBT fam. What's up, Rachel? Good to see you. Yeah, I think Michael Penix now he's one of those guys who is ADP in our dynasty rookie drafts really been fluctuating. So I'm kind of curious to see can he get that day one draft capital that move him back into a potential first round discussion in dynasty landscapes. I'm not I'm not too sure. I think we'll have to continue to wait and see. But who of a couple weeks ago you were saying Hey, I would consider JJ McCarthy at the 107 in my dynasty rookie super flex formats. And now it's not looking crazy. Now it's looking like he will be, be back in that first round conversation. We'll see though, because there was a lot of talent at the wide receiver position on display as well. But before we get there, let's talk about quarterback losers. No one too serious of note here. Uh, who have you called Sam Hartman a loser in our upcoming article we're working on? And my loser at the quarterback position was Spencer Radler. I know Spencer wasn't necessarily a guy. We were coming into this process saying, hey, he, he's an athletic guy. That That's why teams are drafting him. But, you know, kind of dead last in the quarterbacks uh, for the 40. Uh, dead last in the broad jump, the three cone, the shuttle. Like, pretty low relative athletic score, 4.31. Um, so, I don't think it's going to bury Radler, uh, Scott. But I think it's definitely going to put him, like, back probably in that, you know, day three pick where he belongs. Yeah, I mean, nothing really changed for me with Rattler because of the combine. I mean, yeah, of course, I would have liked to have seen him do better. You know, the, uh, one of the biggest knocks on him throughout the last couple of years has, you know, been between the ears. There's been a lot of talk about how that's, you know, that's improved. But I've kind of always seen him as a, you know, either late day two or day three, yeah. you know, either come in to be a backup eventually or sit and learn, you know, behind an established starter. So I don't think that's changed. Okay. Okay. Um, who, how do you feel about Sam Hartman? Um, he had to run the 40 all by himself out there. He's in that first group. I kind of felt bad for him. Um, how did you feel about Sam Hartman? I also think we have a little disagreement because I thought Joe Milton was a loser as well. And I, I think you thought he was a potential winner. So thoughts on Hartman, Milton, and kind of this like final tier at quarterback before we move on to the running back position. 
All right. So before we get into into Milton, let's talk about Fabio. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sam Sam Hartman. God, that I, hair is fucking nice. Br- Holy the brunette hell. Fabio. Obviously, he's a fan favorite coming out of the combine. But like, did he show you anything that he's going to be like this this great quarterback that you should invest in? No. But I think that he's going to get drafted, and I'm going to make even though he's my loser of the week of the combine. I'm going to make a bet that he is this year's Mr. Irrelevant. And that's my bet for the year, um, which is currently wow. held, which is currently held by the Jets. So who knows? Maybe he could be the backup to Aaron Rodgers, where him being surrounded by the New York media, he could be a male model on the side and then really rake in the money. So I, like, I hope that for him. I hope he's Mr. Relevant. I hope he's the Brock Purdy and he turns things around. But, like, let's talk about Joe Milton for a second. All right. Joe Milton with that 70-yard bomb. That What did Joe Milton show you that Michael Penix didn't show you already? I just think that Michael Penix is a one-trick pony. He's going to depend on his arm way too much in the NFL. And Joe Milton, like he showed you, he has the same like arm strength and, and capacity. At six not accuracy. five, not fucking at, accuracy. Not, I'll tell okay, you that. But, but you know what's the big knock that everyone always makes about Tennessee players is that what about what if it's a system? Is that there's mistakes that he makes, and like over time that could be fixed. Like I'm not saying he's going to be like this this great quarterback eventually, but who knows? Maybe like in a few years he could get opportunities. He could be like a Kirk Cousins, you know, that kind of just like be a backup. You know how Kirk Cousins was a backup for RG three for a while. He could get an opportunity and maybe develop and and like have the NFL mold him the way the Tennessee didn't because at 6'5", 235, that guy is huge. That's the that's that's such a great quarterback prospect like build that even if it's like like Spencer Rattler, if you're bringing him in, he's gonna cause that controversy. You know, he's like there's gonna be people out there that want to see Spencer Rattler get an opportunity, <laughs> like. Joe Milton's God. not going to get that. Like, you're not going to have a fan base being like, I want Joe Milton. No one's going to do that. So he can just develop properly. Like at six, five, if your quarterback goes down and you have to throw like his body out there, his body is NFL sustainable. Like I, I, I really want to see what, what he can do. If he can really develop in the NFL, like just overall, like that's a big body. That's it's hard to take people down like that. How, how do you feel about but, Milton Scott? Because I'm I'm honestly I wasn't impressed with some of his throwing. I, I wanted to see him run the 40 as kind of a more mobile quarterback. He didn't run the 40, so I don't think he's as fast as maybe maybe he was alluding to earlier uh this offseason. So where do you fall on, on this this discussion? Because I mean I, I call him a loser. Who's calls him a potential winner? Split the difference here. Uh big man throw far. I mean, but other <laughs> basically other than a 70 yard, I mean we all got lulled to sleep by a really long pass by Zach Wilson a few years back. Yeah. Um, So Milton's one of those guys where that's where I bring in that, especially if you, if you want to compare his combine performance to like MPJ, um, that's where you got to bring in the other context and the production profile in college is light years better with Penix junior than it is for Milton. Milton had the, Lowest completion percentage over expected of this class, the lowest big time throw percentage. You know, that was a really nice throw and it seemed effortless, but he, his accuracy and just throwing capability is still a big question for me. Um, yeah. So, but he's also, a, he, at the same time, he is a very exciting prospect um, just because of the sheer size. I would have loved to have seen him run the 40 as well. Um, so, I'm, I do kind of split the difference. I don't necessarily think he was a loser, but I don't think he did. Uh, he didn't do anything that really just You, you don't him. think scouts are reacting to the, 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 the tweets going around about the pass. And yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm so with you. Who In what, my mind. Okay. But like in my mind, sorry to cut you off, but like in my mind, like would, okay. If he's at a fourth round ADP, like let's say he, he goes in the fourth round to a team. Wouldn't you rather just take an opportunity? Like you'd know Penix is going to be a, a, like a, a, like a, He's gonna like he's gonna have to develop, you know. He's gonna have to mature. Joe I, Joe Milton like, and Spencer do not belong on fantasy football rosters. Dynasty, they do not. Well, and Milton might be the only no. quarterback who's older than Penix. Yeah, Joe Milton's up there six years. Yeah, Joe so, Milton's up there it, too. Like you're I'm just saying, if we're doing listen, the comparison game. I would played, you rather take Penix over like 
one of these 45 first round prospects and and then okay would you rather take yeah. Penix over one of these guys and then take someone in the third fourth round that's not like Joe Milton like I think Joe Milton is like the poor man's Michael Penix no I mean me per me personally I don't I don't have Penix going in the first round like I wouldn't want like say the Seahawks were in the 20s I still probably wouldn't want them to invest that in Penix but I mean, it's kind of apples and oranges compared com, comparing going for a quarterback there or waiting and getting him in the fifth round. That's two completely different scenarios. So I mean, yeah, I guess I would rather take I guess I would rather take Milton at cost. But that's kind of more of a fantasy football mindset. Yeah. I'm thinking more of like teams that are going to draft. Like I'm a fifth round, a fifth round guy is not probably going to do anything in the NFL. I just think bottom line, like. I, I just think Milton and I think Radler are going to be irrelevant for fantasy for their careers unless, you know, their starter get, gets hurt. Like, I've played this game long enough. I've played this game long enough, especially in the dynasty format where we're we're clinging to these guys like Desmond Ritter, who, who's a day three pick. We're Matt Corral, who we never even saw Matt Corral on a, a you know, play a All game right. like we, we've been clinging to these guys. What Jake Hayner last year was kind of the hot name coming out of the senior bowl and out of the combine and like. We've just seen it before. So you can miss me. I'll take a shot on a wide receiver or a running back in my third, fourth, fifth round of dynasty super flex rookie drafts rather than, than take the shot on these, these uh, you know, bottom of the barrel quarterbacks here. I mean this more from like team building wise, like Joe Milton over Rattler, who's going to cause the quarterback controversy. If you got two quarterbacks, you don't have any quarterbacks. So Joe Milton, no controversy. Just Fair a enough. big body. Big Fair body. Enough. Let's talk running backs, guys. There were a couple winners here. Um, a couple I, I specifically want to highlight. Um, Jalen Wright. We knew this guy was kind of going to come in here. He was the favorite to win the 40-yard dash for a reason. We knew he was an athletic freak. Won the North Carolina indoor-outdoor uh, track track and field state championship in high school um, for the 55-meter 50, dash. However, I don't think we expected the second longest broad jump in NFL combine history and the fastest uh, five yards acceleration in the past two combines as well. 9.8 RAS, raw athletic score. So I'm, I'm really excited about Jalen right here. And then Raymond Davis, uh, Ray Davis, he, he goes by for short. Top 10 in the 40, 11th in the vertical jump. Good numbers overall, but... He, if you guys saw the Deuce Staley drill this guy fucking did, it was unbelievable. It was one of the cleanest Deuce Staley drills I've ever seen at the Combine. And Daniel Jeremiah Scott could not shut up about Ray Davis. Like, Ray Davis apparently blew everyone away with interviews. He's a great story. He was a homeless kid. Made, made something of himself. So you love to hear the story of Ray Davis. He might be sneaking up there to be, you know, one of the first couple running backs drafted. Muted as well, Scott. Sorry, my dogs were barking and not my, my feet were not tired. My actual dogs were barking. Um, I've been loosely working on a my own prospect model based on various uh, advanced stat variables okay. and inputs for a while. So I've been just kind of experimenting around with it. And my, my really kind of teaching myself how to do this, my really only way to really check it is insert the running back prospects for the last seven, eight years. And, you know, if, if it has B. John Robinson at RB 15, then there's probably something wrong with it, but it's been pretty good about, you know, predicting the, the way the, you know, for the most part and Ray Davis has been, you know, we don't have draft capital yet. Obviously that's, that's going to be a piece yeah. of it. Um, but Ray Davis has consistently, as I've tweaked around with it, been near the top of this class from a statistical profile standpoint. Um, his stats are, his stats jump off the screen. Um, that, you know, and the fact that he had a good combine, I mean, even with the stats jumping out, it kind of reminded me a little bit of, uh, Pierre strong, um, when he came into the league, because he also just stats, just green across the board. Um, the draft capital didn't really do him any favors and the, all the mocks I'd been seeing, you know, up leading up to the combine had Ray Davis as a fifth day three guy. Yeah. So I was like, well, we don't have draft capital yet, so I'm not going to completely scrap my, my rudimentary prospect model until we have draft yeah. capital but yeah i mean he's a guy that is if you're if you look at the if you look at the production profile he's got it, you know so the fact that he had a good combine i think he i think he helped his nfl draft stock probably quite a bit with the stats he showed 
actually kind of a pretty nice fucking pass catcher as well. I, I think that's something we kind of forget about. Had 95 receptions across his five seasons, and he was kind of a guy who jumped around different schools. He was at Temple for a couple of years, then Vanderbilt, then Kentucky. Uh, had seven receiving touchdowns last year, though. So, like, kind of reminds me of, like, a Ramondre Stevenson profile, like a sneaky good pass catcher and kind of still a big bruising running back with some quick uh, one-cut ability as well. So, I like Ray Davis. I, I think he's going to be someone I'm going to have on my radar, especially in these underdog best balls I'm continuing to do right now, kind of towards the end, take a couple flyers there, and we'll see what the draft capital is and kind of where he shakes out for uh, Dynasty rookie drafts. Who I wanted to ask you about a guy you're probably familiar with, though, as well. Uh, oh, hey, we cashed the ticket, baby. Isaac Garendo uh, from Louisville, 16 to 1, fastest combine. Super excited to cash that. But this was a guy a couple years ago. He was at Wisconsin, was kind of the lightning to Braylon Allen's thunder, scored five TDs in his senior year, then transferred for his fifth year to Louisville, where he more than doubles his previous carry amount, sets career highs across the board. Number one, not only in the 40 who with a 4.33, a vertical that was number one, second in the broad jump, and it was still 221 fucking pounds which makes no sense how a guy that size can move this quickly. Like it's not like an A-chan situation where he's light, he's he's small. He, he's somewhat of a bruiser that can also run lights out. Like how did we miss how did everyone miss this guy? Everyone missed it. I think that a lot of you know me. Like any any running back that comes from Wisconsin in my opinion is going to be a dog. <laughs> because, like, that's just RBU, in my opinion. Like, the way that they develop running backs and the way that the Big Ten set up is that it's just so run heavy. It's so smash mouth, hit you in the mouth yeah. football that that when he transferred, it, like, yeah, I kind of forgot because, like, it's really not a split backfield. It is, but it's not. Like, like when Jonathan Taylor's there, it's the JT show. When Braylon Allen's there, it's the Braylon Allen show. When Melvin Gordon was there, it was the Melvin Gordon show. So, like, that's just kind of how it is. And you kind of forget about the next guy, but once the next guy, like once, once Braylon Allen went to the, like went to the NFL, like if Isaac was going to be the guy, then like everyone was going to remember that. So like, it's just the way that they develop running backs. I'm always going to be in favor of that. So like, yeah, you should definitely be cashing your ticket. Like I did, I thought Braylon Allen was going to be the RB one of this class. I was wrong. I'll, I'll already eat my crow on that one because that ain't it after the combine performance that he showed me. Um, but, but man, this guy really has potential to be the RB one this year. Yeah. I, I like him. I think he pushed himself into potentially early day three pick. I, I don't think he quite got into day two, but I think he could still be an early day three pick. Right. Jalen, how do you prefer? Do you still prefer Jalen Wright over him? Do you think Scott, like, like do you, do you project Jalen Wright as a potential day two pick? Do you, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. I hadn't really heard of Isaac Garendo too much until the combine. Yeah. Um, part of that is that the source I use for prospect data, he he wasn't there. Um, that will be that will be revised. You know, typically where I get my data, Peter Howard, his database. Um, once the combine happens, everybody that went to the combine gets added. Mm -hmm. So I didn't. I mean, but I mean, he almost broke uh, math bombs relative of athletic score formula. I mean, you got a 9.99 out of 10. Not That hasn't happened very often. Um, highest speed score in the class, which is a, it's a weight adjusted 40 time. It's a little bit okay. more predictive than, a, than a, just a 40 time. Um, you know, because that's, you know, on counterpoint, Bucky Irving's 40 at his smaller weight was terrible. Yeah. But I do still, I do still, um, I still prefer Jalen Wright. He was, he had the second highest relative athletic score. Yep. He also had a blazing fast 40. Um, you know, I think he had the third highest speed score. And then the burst score, which is what that, that's where the the broad jump and the vertical jump are calculated into a score. Um, you know, it was basically him, it was Jalen Wright, Isaac uh Garendo, and um Trey Benson. Those, Trey those Benson, three, yep, our final those winner. Are the three that really showed out. And for me right now, Trey Benson is, you know. I like still like Jonathan Brooks, but the injury has me a little bit, little tinge of worry. I I would put probably Trey Benson at the top. Yeah, I, I think Trey Benson, it's hard not to maybe leapfrog. Like I, I was a Braylon Allen RB1 guy. Bucky Irving was in my top three. I'm way lower on those guys now. But looking at Trey Benson, like it's hard not to get excited about a guy, a guy who's six foot, 216 pounds, and somehow ran a 439 as well. Like like you said, 9.77 relative athletic score, 
looked really good in all the drills, like looked like potentially the best running back in all the drills. So yeah, I, I like Trey Benson a lot. I think that was a miss on us. I, I think we should have been higher that on him coming into this process. Um, all right, though, let's go to the losers. Uh, Hoove, we are way too fucking high on Braylon Allen. Didn't run the 40. So obviously I, I, I think that tells me the speed's not there and dropped a shit ton of passes. So um, thoughts on, on a guy like Braylon Allen before we get to the rest of these disappointments. I really thought that he was going to be like more like a Najee Harris of this class, just like the size, the build. People were comping him to Derrick Henry, but that just didn't seem appropriate in my opinion. Like he could have, like in my opinion, just like he can be electric, but the way, like the holes that he has aren't going to translate to the NFL. Like if you can't pass block, you are not going to get opportunity to be on the field at all. So like, that's a big thing in his game. And the fact that he's just like, isn't a receiver as well. Like that means he's basically AJ Dillon. I feel like even AJ Dillon has more like passing blo oh, like pass block don't, ability. Don't write him and off yet like that. Just, it was just it's one... more, it's more the fact that, that I don't, I, I really view this class as a weak running back class. And if you can't stand out in this class, in those things, like you'll yeah, be, you'll be replaceable good next point. year. Like if you can't do this in this class, then you're next year, someone else is going to come in and they're going to take that spot. Like, like everyone was talking about uh Kenneth Walker forever. Like what, even, even if Braylon Allen came in and like, was just an awesome running back for fantasy, like right off the bat as a rookie, like just because he has these holes, like they're going to have to go out and get a Zach Charbonnet because like, he just can't do it. Like you need to find a guy and everyone's going to get worried about your opportunity because of it. Yeah. Dylan Johnson, also a disappointment. Uh, man, I this is the second year in a row I've not been impressed with, with the running back on the losing team of the national championship. Dylan Johnson pretty much d dead last or close to dead last in a lot of the categories. Second to last in the 40, last in the 10-yard split, second to last in the vertical, and uh, fifth worst in the broad jump. So didn't like what we saw from Dylan Johnson. He's off my draft board. Uh, he already was pretty low for me. What about Audric Estamine, though? I mean, this guy, great, great final season here uh, out for Notre Dame. Probably a day three pick, though, now after running the slowest 40 time for the running backs, 4.71 40 time. Uh, and, you know, like had an acceptable uh, vertical and, and broad jump, but still just not good enough. And like, I just don't think these these slow plotting running backs, larger backs, they just don't cut it anymore, man. Like, look at Tank Bigsby and what he did. He was fucking dog shit. It, like, like Tank Bigsby sucks, and I, I, I worry, I worry that Audric could be potentially going down that lane as well. Um, so I'm worried about Audric. I like, I was taking him in a lot of third round of rookie, uh, rookie mock drafts, and I won't be doing that anymore. And then Bucky Irving here uh, as well, who Bucky Irving kind of falls flat on his face, as Scott talked about, a little guy, five nine, one ninety two way lighter than I think some of us thought he was going to come in here and kind of a slow 40 time as well. 4.55. And it's disappointing to see that for, for Bucky Irving, this guy had the third best odds to run the fastest 40. He was 14th. Like, how does that happen? I feel like there must be some lingering injury stuff that that's not coming out or even, or even if there wasn't, he was, if I was, the a, jump, if I was his manager, if I was his manager, I would be pushing that regardless. Like after watching that Mansell documentary, I'd be lying through my teeth. I'd be saying that like, he was hurt. He was pushing through it to give opportunity. Like, um, like that was terrible. Like if you were finished 14th and you were like that far up in the betting odds, like something's going on, something's going on. And that could be mentally. That could yeah. be physically. We don't know. Like something's going on with that. That's just, that's red flag. Number one. Scott, do you just think this is who kind of Bucky Irving and, and S Esteem are? And like, keep in mind, Bucky got a lower RAS score, 3.72. Audric at least saved his a, a little bit with, with some of his jumping. So are you, where are you at on these guys? Because I'm like really disappointed. I liked a, lo a lot of these guys' tape. Yeah, I mean, same deal. Um, both Esteem and Bucky Irving, you know, in my, in my model, um, you know, no combine results, obviously no draft capital. We're both very high with their production yeah. profiles. Um, I'm more out on Bucky than I am esteem just because esteem had a rough 40 time. Other than that, 
He was in the top five in vertical, broad jump, and burst score, which comes from those two things. And to still have an RAS above eight with yeah, a four point seven one forty, I saw that. Yeah, like okay, he doesn't have the. But you know, again, like you have to kind of start thinking like, are we putting too much into a straight line forty yard dash um, when you know the burst score is more about their athleticism and explosiveness? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I esteem might be one of those guys. And again, if he goes day three, it kind of throws things a little bit out of the yeah. water a little bit. Um, so that really will tell the tale with both of these guys. Um, you know, because I just don't know how much NFL teams are really putting into the combine mm -hmm. as far as they're making their decisions. Like somebody like Bucky Irving or Roderick esteem who had, you know, were very productive in college, um, is their terrible day. They're terrible one day in the off season doing, you know, doing these tests enough for them to drop them a few rounds. I don't know. You know, okay. we'll see. Um, yeah. But if, if I'm picking now, cause we can't always just say, well, it depends on where they're drafted. Talk to me then. Um, I am more willing right now to take a discount on esteem um, than I am Irving. Yeah. And Bucky Irving, keep in mind that when we were doing our, uh, our uh, underdog fantasy live draft last week, Scott, like Bucky was going uh, above a lot of these guys that we're talking about as winners, Trey Benson, uh, way ahead of Ray Davis, way ahead of Jalen Wright. So I think that will correct itself a little bit. Um, but, but definitely some red flags for, for a couple of running backs we liked. We'll see how it shakes out in the dynasty lens. Once they get some draft capital attached to those names, but yeah, definitely lower on them. N not the smash picks. I think we thought they were a couple weeks ago. Um, but so good to get, gather a little bit of uh, information there. Let's go to the wide receivers though, where we saw the most fireworks this past weekend here. And I know it's hard for like Rome Adunze to technically be a riser when he was already like the, the wide receiver three in this class, the yeah. best one performing at the combine. Um, but he just easily looked like the best wide receiver out there in drills. It was insane. He looked like a potential alpha, um, in some of those catching drills. And then 9.91 .9 relative athletic scores, Scott, you got to like that for, from a modeling point of view. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've watched it all year. Um, you know, and I, I feel like I've remained pretty objective, like as this college season ended and as we approached the convoy combine, everybody's like, Oh, you think Penix is going to go 16 to the Seahawks? I'm like, I really hope not. Yeah, that's way too high for Penix. Like, yeah, I wasn't, you know, I'm not like immersed in the friggin' hometown Kool-Aid, <laughs> but I don't think I don't think it means I'm immersed in the hometown Kool-Aid to say, yeah, Odunze is, you know, he's a dog. Like there's been a there's been a question going around as of late. Who's the better prospect of Dunze or JSN? I think it's Odunze. Um, and I'm and I was very high on JSN last year. So, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting them above the, the top two. Those are the top two. I know they didn't yeah. do anything, even with the fireworks we had at the combine still didn't matter that they didn't do anything. Those are the top two wide receivers, put them in whatever order you want. Um, but Adunze, yeah, I think he, you know, he can't really climb from three, but I think he's locked in at that spot. And I think from a dynasty lens in your rookie drafts this year, like, Odunze is making a point like, hey, he could go like 105, 104, even in a super flex format. It wouldn't be a reach right now. Like, I think that's kind of what he showed me at the combine is like I had this kind of internal debate. Was it Rome? Was it Brock Bowers? If let's say the first two wide receivers go off the board and it's just, the, you know, maybe Jaden Daniels there. Where do I factor in Rome? Like, dude, like right now, if I have the 104, 105, I'm feeling a lot better about it uh, in in my dynasty rookie drafts here moving forward because well, of Rome. 106 and 107. Just because if if he does get pushed up there, then you're you're getting one of the quarterbacks or potentially Brock yeah. Bauer falling to you. Yeah. Or you're getting a Dunze there. You know what I mean? Yep. Um. So, but yeah, yeah, you're right though. The 104, 105, a really good spot to be in. Um, I mean, we'll see. I still do think there's a drop off from neighbors and Harrison to Odunze, but I don't think it's yeah. as significant as a lot of people think or a lot of people, you know, have speculated right there with you. We got Eric on his night off saying, my dudes, good to see you, Eric. Thanks for tuning in, man. Um, speaking of Eric, let's talk about the wide receiver uh, when we were doing our draft last week that we got sniped for that turns out to be the biggest winner. We cashed another ticket here plus 290 on Xavier Worley to be the, the top wide receiver in the 40-yard dash here. Uh, runs a 4.21. I didn't think we'd ever see it. Breaks John Ross's infamous record. Um, he's been a heavily debated prospect for years and years. 
in these Debbie circles, who because he comes out his freshman year, 62, 981, and 12 touchdowns, but only scores 14 receiving touchdowns the rest of his college career. Kind of has some problems with some concentration drops. But we know, man, like, like we saw it in that Alabama game earlier this season with Matthew McConaughey standing in the end zone broadcast. And like the dude, it can take the fucking top off. And not only is he a deep threat, the guy can take it, take a slant and take it to the house a lot like we saw George Pickens do. How high do you do you put Xavier Worthy? Do you think there's any way he gets past pick 30, 32 in your mock draft with the Chiefs sitting there? No, he uh, no. he's definitely moved his way up to the top, top 32 picks. Like, but he's one of those players that just with the speed, like you know the Quinn you were like yours ain't it. And that's that's a lot of the reason why he's just like his game tape is just capped. Like his just talent is just capped on his game tape. So once the cap gets taken off in the NFL, oh, this guy's the limit for this guy. So I'm excited for him. But it just really comes down to opportunity and like who's his quarterback and whatnot. So like I'm like I'm not gonna take I'm not going to take him over Brian, Brian Thomas okay. Jr., you know, but yeah. that's just because BTJ is my wide receiver three. And I just, I'm, I'm really excited for that. But besides, besides the point, Worthy, in my opinion, he's pretty much moved himself into the 108, 109 territory. Okay. Scott, how do you feel like about Xavier Worthy? We know we've kind of crushed the, uh, <laughs> Hey, small receivers can't light receivers can't work in this league theory. The last couple of years, Jordan Addison, Devonta Smith kind of come to mind. How does he kind of factor into to your modeling and everything you're doing factoring his both his size and his speed that he showed in Indianapolis? I love me some Xavier Worthy. And that was wasn't that two weeks ago? I, it was I was on the pod when we got sniped because I'll never I think it was it. last week, last week. Oh, OK. Um, so so I, 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 I dove into Worthy. I might actually write kind of a full deep dive article for fantasy data just on worthy. Um, Cause I saw, you know, you, the, the, the obvious comps came out, like here are the really, really fast, here are the top, you know, fastest 40 runners over the last, whatever. So, so, you know, you got your Taekwondo Thorntons, you've got your, you've got your Henry Ruggs, you've got uh, John Ross and then yep. you've got Marquise Goodwin, you've got Jacoby Ford. You've just got all these guys. So I was like, okay. Cause I just was like, because the way it gets presented is so backwards. It's like, well, if he would have just been a little bit slower, he'd have a better chance in the NFL. It's like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? So I decided yeah. to look into it. So what I did is I looked at those receivers with a sub 4-340 who went, who went in the first or second round of the NFL draft. I cut out the guys that went fifth round, sixth round. That's not what we're talking about here. And I mean, you know, all signs are pointing worthy will go in the first or second round of the draft, right? I think that's accurate. So that's John Ross, Henry Ruggs, Tyquan Thornton. Um, so I looked at their college profiles. Like, are we talking about the same thing here? Are we just talking about a 40 time? And I mean, were these college production profile light years better than all three of those guys? Dude, he had a he had the breakout age, the 30% breakout age, which means 30% of his team's receiving yards and receiving touchdowns as a freshman, true freshman. Mm -hmm. um, John Ross had a touchdown and like 200 receiving yards as a freshman. All, th all three of the other guys, nothing as a freshman. Uh, mostly did their things in, in their final year of college. Um, Xavier Worthy is in this class. He is the, if you look at college career, he is the target share leader of this class. You know, none of the other guys anywhere near that. Okay. So, I mean, his his college production profile is is a completely different thing than those three receivers. So if you're going to comp those three receivers to worthy, you're really just saying they're all really fast. And to me, that's like, that's leaving so much of it out. Yeah. So, I mean, I have him, him and BTJ. I've, they're right there at four. Or, oh, uh, wow. Four, okay. Four, four and five for me. Okay. Yeah. Here's that list actually over from the fancy football advice network. Our guy fat squirtle posted it. Uh, here's the list of just a couple of names from the last couple of years. The fastest runner in the 40 yard dash Trey Palmer last year, Tyquan Thornton, as you mentioned, Anthony Schwartz of the Browns who never did anything. 2020 Henry Ruggs also fast off the field as we learned Andy Isabella, Paris Campbell, DJ Chark, like, mm -hmm. And he kind of asked, like, who has the, had the best career out of all these guys? And it's like, it is DJ Chark. But still, I, I I think, you know, you make a good point, Scott, that, hey, man, just because these these burners didn't didn't work out, like, they're, you know, doesn't mean that Xavier Worthy isn't going to work out. I mean, like, it can't be underestimated or overlooked to 
you know, a 30% breakout age of, of 18. Of, yeah. Of doing what he did. And I know he he didn't he didn't ever reach that again, but he was still consistent. He yeah. didn't have any like, you know, John Ross had two terrible years and then he was hurt and then he had a really good year. Yep. And then he went in the first round because he ran a really fast forward. So I mean that is a gross, disgusting list you just showed. I get it. It's totally yeah. disgusting. But you know, if you bring in all the other context, it's you know, it's it's a yeah. we're talking about a different type of player here. I would go out on a limb and say that if if Worthy would have went in the draft last year, that he would be the wide receiver two over Addison, confidently. Maybe like, it would have uh, been, been JSN and then Worthy. It's going to be interesting to compare this wide receiver class to last year's, you know, especially with the the late right round. Now, there is so much freaking hype about this wide receiver yeah. class. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of this wide receiver class, let's talk about some other winners. It was Brian Thomas Jr. as who alluded to his wide receiver four in this class. 9.97 RAS. You got to love that. Coming off a season where he scored over 17 touchdowns here, we've seen that this guy looks like a potential playmaker. I think even though Xavier Worthy ran the fastest 40, Brian Thomas's looked the most natural. Brian Thomas was just gliding out there. Brian and- Thomas's was arguably more impressive if you factor in height and weight. Yeah. His his yes. 40 time was arguably, even though it didn't break the record, it was arguably a more impressive athletic achievement than than worthy. And I think the exciting thing, exciting thing about Brian Thomas Jr. is like he's kind of a late bloomer. We didn't really see him take off in college until this past season. So like he still has a shit ton of untapped upside that I think is out there, Hoof. BTJ is my wide receiver three this year. I got I got obviously Marv and then I got um, the LSU boys, and then I got Rome. But then I also like I'm really big on Jalen Polk too. But we'll get we can talk about that later. But like that's kind of why I slight Penix in the first place with Rome. But Brian Thomas Jr. Like he just like watching his tape. I you just get excited watching like watching his tape. Like this is like this is an alpha. Like if he would have been on any other team in college football, yeah. he'd been a wide receiver one. Yeah. But he was up against Malik Neighbors, who's the next Jamar Chase. So, like, of course, he's even a wide receiver, too. But, like, this guy's a dog. So, like, I don't know. I feel like he's definitely going to be in that white, in that 105, 106 territory real quick. And I got, like, a 108 pick. So, I'm hoping that because I, re- like, yeah. I really want to go into draft day and be like, do I want Brian Thomas Jr. or do I want J.J. McCarthy? Yeah, it, it'll be exciting. I, I'm excited to see kind of what his prop line is for the over-under on him because I think now after this performance, we are looking at him maybe like a late day one selection, potentially between picks 20 and 32. I think now he's pushing for a top 15 pick uh, after what we saw BTJ do out there. And, and Scott, where do you have a Donnie Mitchell? He's another Texas wide receiver kind of heavily debated as well because didn't really have a lot of production the two previous seasons at Georgia, just over 600 yards in 21 games for the Bulldogs before coming to Texas here this past year. Um, But does look like a really complete receiver actually had the best RAS relative athletic score, 9.98 among all these wide receivers, fast guy ran a great 40 sub four, four 11, four broad jump too. How do you feel about uh, having a potential other Texas uh, Longhorn here in the first round of the NFL draft? Yeah, I, I mean, I like, I really like both LSU boys, just like Hoove, and I really, I really like both Texas boys too. Um, yeah. I have Worthy slightly higher than Mitchell. Mitchell, Ooh, his, his production profile is just has a few more red flags. Yeah, in yep, it. yep. I agree. I agree. Um, but he had a, I mean, if we're talking strictly about the combine, yeah, he was, he was a big winner at the combine as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the thing is like, you've seen it, I've seen it on Twitter. It's like all of a sudden, and there's two ways to, you know, there's two ways to play it in dynasty, but all of a sudden that the back half of the first round is not the wasteland that many thought it might be. And nobody really ever thought it was a wasteland. It's just more of a tear break. Right. Mm -hmm. But I just don't think the tear break is as significant, um, as it was. No, but I said, there's two ways to look at it. Either be happy you have one of those or try and Try and try and cap, try and capitalize off that and get something yeah. for your late round pick with all this combine hype around all these receivers that you're now like like Mitchell or or BTJ and BTJ is just fun to say too. So <laughs> we need him in the league. It's right. Fun to say, right. Right. <laughs> so, right. Um, yeah. It's interesting because I'm in a couple of places where I have a high pick and some rookie drafts right now, like 102, 103. 
And if Marvin Harrison Jr. isn't there on the, in those specific teams, I already have some really good quarterbacks that I don't need a, a, a second or a third quarterback where like I'm trying to figure out how can I get from the 103 and trade actually maybe back to the 107 or the 108 so I can grab guys like um, like a Mitchell or a Worthy or potentially a BTJ. If, like, like If you're in that, if you're after the first couple picks and you don't need a quarterback, you can cash in this year for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, here's some some wide receiver losers from the NFL Combine. Keon Coleman, I think, is the biggest one, and it's really tough to to kind of bullseye these bigger wide receivers who test poorly. Um, but I I really do weigh it, man. I, I was looking at Xavier Leggett coming into this week, and and he tested pretty well actually. Um, but when when I see a guy like Keon Coleman do this, it reminds me of Traylon Burks a couple years ago. And it was major red flags for me when I saw Burks not perform at the combine because he wasn't at, at, as freaky as we thought as compared to like five or six years ago when DK came in and we we're like, holy shit, this guy's huge. And he's also a freak athlete. Coleman, not 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 really the same thing. Who I, I, I'm, I'm a little worried about him when he's getting beat uh, in the 40 yard dash by his freak teammate, Johnny Wilson, who's like the tallest wide receiver we, we've seen at the combine in the last two fucking decades. We knew the straight line speed wasn't going to be there for Coleman, but is he the next Calvin Benjamin? That's what Twitter's saying right now. Oh, man. Johnny Wilson. <laughs> that guy's going to be good in the NFL. Like, it's a wide receiver, too. Like, if, if, Atlantic, oh. could, if Atlantic can capitalize and grab Johnny Wilson to be that wide receiver, too, on the opposite side of Drake London, that would be a chef's kiss. That'd be sweet. But, oh, man, Steve's not going to be happy. Our, our homeboy, Steve, is not going to be happy you're dissing Keon Coleman, but it's it's justified. It's it's that this wide receiver class is so stacked that, like, if you're not stepping out of it, then you're just going to be, like, an afterthought. And, mm-hmm. like, that wide receiver four to wide receiver 15 tier is so quick. It's so slight that you could drop off real fast. Like, I've, like in my, I remember my first mock draft, I had Keon Coleman going to, like, the Bengals yeah. at, like, 17th. Yeah. There's no way he's going, he's in that tier anymore. Like he's definitely dropped into the second round. Um, just based off of like positions too. Could he slide into the third? Who knows? Like there's guys like Ricky Purcell Purcell. Yeah. That's, yeah. That have really kind of stepped yeah. out. And like, would you rather like wait and draft him over a Keon Coleman? I don't know. They're like, I'm not a GM, but like, you know what I mean? Like, there's just so much value in this draft that you might not have to take a stab on the Keon Coleman's of the draft. And he was a guy who not that long ago, Scott, was going in the first round of, of, of Superflex rookie drafts. I think he's definitely backed into a second round pick. And my only other loser here is Javon Baker. I just don't get the hype for this guy. He's supposed to be a deep threat, but he's kind of slow is what we learned at the combine, finishing pretty low in the 40. Um, your thoughts on, on kind of these... Uh, Bigger wide receivers like Baker, like Coleman, who turned up a little slow, Scott, or does it give you pause? Um, it does. I mean, I think who who kind of hit the points with it for me, at least. Okay. You know, as, a, as a dynasty manager, I mean, I just think because it's such a stacked class. And I mean, the thing is, is like we're all going to be wrong about some of this. And yeah, I'll, I'm fine to be wrong about it. You know, I was the same with Traylon Burks. I stayed as far away from Traylon Burks as I could. Um, I think the Titans, I ran- probably, Titans should have probably taken some some advice from all of us, and they wouldn't. They would still have AJ Brown. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there's just it. It'll depend on where they're going. But it, like even even if they even if they fall in in value in ADP because of the poor showing, they're still going to fall into a range where I'm probably like I'm going to go for a different position right there at that spot. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I probably won't end up with many of either of these two guys. Yeah. Uh, agreed with you let's talk tight ends and round out this combine discussion theo fucking johnson oh my God. <laughs> so he, i just have to say it i he have this to... model what are we fucking doing in state college i'm a penn state fan i was a season ticket holder for years number two tight end in the 40 theo johnson number two in the broad jump three in the vertical number one in the shuttle and a relative athletic score of nine point fucking nine nine oh, i just i just don't look. get it why does this guy only have 34 receptions in his past year at Penn State here? They have Drew Aller. It's not like they have a dog shit quarterback. And he had no more than 20 receptions the year before. Like Penn State, as good as they are at putting tight ends in the league, they're terrible at fucking underutilizing them. Brenton Strange, he was dog shit in the league last year. We saw that, but but he 
was kind of the same guy underutilized at Penn state, like Jawan Johnson. If you guys uh, know him from the saints, he was a wide receiver at Penn state. Cause they didn't know he could be a tight end. Like Pat Fryermuth finally like had eight touchdowns as a freshman in this Penn state offense. What does he do? Never has stats that good again. Like Penn state is terrible at using tight ends. And like, is Theo Johnson that freaking good? Is he like, what's going on here? I'm, I, I'm perplexed boys. I'm frustrated. I'm upset. But Fucking there's a thing that. there's a thing too is that he's also a big ten tight end. And like that's just what like what I mean is like big tens all hit you in the mouth, and that means having a dominant you can tight, use a tight end. end though. You can use a tight they don't you I don't know, man. Theo Johnson let me down in some games. He had some ugly drops as well. Scott, how does your model weigh like kind of a shit ass career with with an absolutely perfect combine weekend? Like where where's the middle? To be honest, the only thing I'm like attempting right now are running backs and receivers. Okay. Um, but I would strongly recommend um, to plug my my guy, my who I'm a fanboy of. Um, JJ Zacharyson is adding to his prospect model for the first time this year, a tight end model, um, which from what I've listened to what he's described about it, um, more so than any other position, these combine metrics matter a lot. Like the athleticism for a tight end, the 40 score for a tight end, the speed score for a tight end is a, is a much bigger input into the overall score as compared okay. to wide receiver and running back. Okay. Um, so, I mean, Theo Johnson, I mean, I'm look, I'm looking at his, you know, I'm at, I'm at math bombs, RAS website and it says 10 here. Everything's green. Yeah. Like it can't be ignored. I mean, like the, it, the way the tight end position works in the NFL you can't necessarily bank as much on a production profile in college for the tight end position. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just leaving Brenton strange where he is on my benches right now because tight end takes a while to develop. We saw that with Nijoku. Um, yeah. I'm hoping we see that with Noah Fant this year, but you know, it can take a while to develop. So really what you have to go, what you have to go on coming into the league, this athleticism plays a huge part of it. So, you know, I don't know where this puts him, you know, Bowers obviously is number one. But another tight end that we're going to talk about soon, who I think has been somewhat of a consensus tight end too in this class, might not be anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Who, before we talk about that tight end loser, do you have another winner for us at the position? I do. Because this guy, like, it's pretty similar to last year. Is like, you got a, a Michael Mayer and a Brock Bowers, and you got a Theo Johnson and a Sam Laporta. But this guy, as my tight end three, you got Dallin Hoker out of Colorado State. This guy said dog. Just like I just I'm sorry. I just was looking up the stats. All green. Just like just like Scotty was talking about. Just all green with his metrics. A four seven eight with his 40 yard dash. Come on. Like just give me, gimme. This guy is the Luke Musgrave of the draft. He's four, gonna be seven, that pretty slow though, isn't it? Like uh, I guess I for know. the depends on, his, depends on his depends on his size. He is six three, two forty one. So I feel yeah. like that's pretty big. I feel yeah. like that's good. I feel like that's good size. I'm pretty excited. Just look, like go back and watch his tape. And this guy just gets open. Like, I don't want to say, I don't want to say he's like Travis Kelsey, but like there's not many tight ends that you watch their tape and they just like find an ability to get open like that. He is so good. Just go back, go watch his tape. At what did you like him specifically at the combine then? Just like how he was performing in the drills. Is that more what you were looking at? Yeah, I feel like. I feel like that he was just kind of standing out of this class and that he was like showing that he was kind of in that tier. Like Theo Johnson obviously was the clear winner at the position. Yeah. But like if you were what if you were watching some of those drills and just like watching him like him participate, I feel like he was really kind of just showing NFL GMs the right things and how he uh, performs. Okay. Yeah, because he's dead fucking last in the 40. <laughs> that's all I that's all I say. No, that. Is he really? Yeah, no, he's, he's six overall in uh and tight end ranking. So he's like not overall the greatest, but yeah. if you're watching, watching how he performs the drills, like it's like CrossFit. Like if you're not doing it right, you can do it fast though, but he's doing it right. Let's talk about the definite, and it's hard to say loser at the tight end position, but Jatavion Sanders, like apparently not all Texas pass catchers, you know, showed up here over the weekend, pretty low overall performance from him, Scott. Um, 
lower in the 40 than I think a lot of us expected uh, as well with a 4.69 and just kind of towards the bottom of the barrel a lot of these uh, of a lot of these uh, time drills out there I, I was you know kind of a bummer to see that from Sanders who we were expecting to be that clear tight end to here yeah I mean you know if we're picking if we're assigning the labels of losers and winners to each position at the combine he is the clear tight end loser just because of his size because he's not he's not huge no. Um, so his 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 um, adjusted his adjusted speed score based on his forty time is not great. So I mean it's it's you know I I, I always preach it. I'm not he's not done. He's not not yeah. being drafted because he had ran yeah. a bad forty and had a bad combat. Yeah. Um, but with what we do and how we project at different stages of the off season, not good. Not good for his stock. Probably not mm-hmm. not going to be good for his actual NFL draft stock. Um, you know, whether, whether you agree with that or not, it's, it's, it's just the way it's always been like, yeah. you know, a, a combine performance like that from a tight end, regardless of how hyped he was, um, is going to have an impact. So, um, I still really like him. You know, I got to, I watched him in the, in the semifinal game. Yeah. I watched all those Texas boys in the semifinal game against the Huskies. Um, yeah. and I mean, you know, he stood out. He stood out in that game. I was, you know, I was the one that was like, why can't they stop Sanders? You know what I mean? Like while I'm watching yeah. my team uh, lose their lead. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, he, he hurt himself a bit. Is he still a day two pick for you guys? You think still a day two pick Jatavion Sanders? No. I still think he sneaks into day two. Okay. But potentially Theo Johnson can go ahead ahead of him now. Who do you think so? Yes. Okay. I agree with that too. Confidently, okay. and I think Dallin Hoker sneaks up above him too. Okay, awesome. Well, we're going to transition away from combine talk and, and talk a little entertainment here uh, before we transition back to some uh, some questions here from the forum. If you guys have any questions in the chat, let us know. Um, and you can also feel free to go back as we covered each position earlier in this episode. Um, but man, March. This is usually not a month we, we think of a lot of good movie, TV, or, or music uh, releases coming out. But I, I thought, you know, actually some pleasant surprises here um, in, in the month of March, which it's getting a little nicer out. So not as much time to, to do some binging or uh, to, to do some movie watching, but still some good stuff coming out here. Uh, Scott, what was your favorite thing that, that's either coming to theaters or coming to streaming or anything that caught your eye here for the month of March? So outside of my peculiar binge of cosmic and thriller horror movies over the last year where i've just been cycling through it, all of them that i can yeah um i have not seen the first new dune and yeah. therefore i have not seen the second new dune um i'm a big fan of dune um from the book but i just haven't seen the new movies yeah um and honestly i'm kind of excited about that because i love a good franchise you know what i mean like i've watched yeah. the born movies I, I've lost count how many times I've gone through that. And I'm very, like, I feel kind of like, you know, like when you watch something that's awesome and you're done and somebody comes to you and they're like, I'm watching it for the first time. You're like, oh, I wish I could go back and watch it. For yeah. The first time. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel about doing, especially with some of the reactions I've seen from some people um, about, about the second one. So I'm very excited to dive into both of them. Um, maybe I'll find a day with enough time to just watch both of them consecutively. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah, um, I'll probably have to space it out. They're long. Well, They're long too. They're two plus well, hours. A lot of times, like when I'm watching movies nowadays, like my wife doesn't. She's not into like cosmic sci-fi yeah. horror movies like I am somehow now. Um, <laughs> but like I don't, I don't have the time. So a lot of times I watch bits and pieces of them as I'm working yeah. at the gym, as I'm walking, yeah. you know, working, whatever, whatever it might be, you know, not working, but like just doing something else. I'll, I'll, I'll watch, you know, bits and pieces here and there before work. So, but yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to watch, uh, to watch the Dune movies. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Dune coming out, man, or just came out this last week. So, uh, excited for that. Who, what are you excited for it, uh, to release here in March, my friend? I'm excited on March 8th. I'll probably honestly go opening weekend just because like Heidi and I like going out opening weekend yeah. movies. I mean, that's like our date night things. Cause I love movie theater popcorn. I talk about it many times in the show. I'll actually just go and get the, theater popcorn bring it home but we're gonna go see on march 8th we're gonna go see kung fu panda 4 i feel like this is one of those times that i'm just gonna take the opportunity because i'm on the platform to give someone their flowers jack black is just someone that is just such a big figure in my childhood yeah. and 
And I feel like he's just so, he's so forgotten about at times when you think about the greatest of all time, like the greatest actors, like one of the greatest voice actors of all time, like up there with Robin Williams of greatest voice actors. Yeah. Like when you think about some of his roles that he's done top tier. So Jack Black, like, of course I'm going to go, I'm going to be there opening weekend. Like I just caught myself randomly, like one weekend when football wasn't on, I was scrolling through the channels on Hulu and I'm like, kung fu panda like i haven't seen yeah, the show yeah. in so long and i ended up just like sitting there like watching too long and heidi's like all right come on babe we gotta go and i'm like okay look, let me let me just finish the scene okay and, like i'm a 24 year old man i should not be like <laughs> like pushing her aside not pushing her aside but you know what i mean pushing yeah. the schedule aside for kung fu panda but here i am because jack black's a goat so Oh, yeah. you, you, you're right, man. Like he's one of the more most underrated and most talented entertainers of my life. You know what I mean? Like all yeah. around. Tenacious yeah. D. You're right. He, he doesn't. He's he's still somehow underrated. I mean, um, so good. yeah, he's you know, it's like he's one of those guys where like when I hear his voice, whether it's in a movie yeah. or as a voice actor, I just feel comfortable and good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I know I'm probably going to laugh pretty soon. And like, it's just, yeah, good call. Uh, aside from that 2015 remake of Goosebumps, dude has been spot on. Doesn't have a lot of bad Amen. performances. Amen. But <laughs> Even in King Kong, he was good. Yeah. No yeah. Speaking uh, of King Kong, they're also with King Kong yes, versus Godzilla yes. coming out. Yes, I saw that. On that as well. Yes. Um, I'm going to go indie. I'm going to go indie with my pick here. I'm going to go with uh, Snack Shack. So the the premise of this, it's a throwback movie, Nebraska City, summer 1991, baby. Two best friends, AJ Moose. Uh, Their initial plan to make money over the summer is that they are going to gamble on dog races and sell home-brewed beer. They're they're high school teenagers. They're like 14-year-olds. But instead, an opportunity comes up. They can actually buy the snack shack at the local pool. So they go ahead and do that. Um, they meet a girl who kind of comes between them, some little riffraff going on. But this movie, just not only do I love like little indie movies to support, you know, support those types of filmmakers and actors and actresses. Um, but this movie, just like, watching the previews reminded me so much of like my summers as a kid, you know, getting ripped on by our parents for doing some dumb shit down the street, um, smoking darts, hanging out like w- with people way too old for us and just living life and, and growing, man. And uh, so so Snack Shack, March 15th in theaters. Uh, I think it will also be at, on Paramount Plus later this month as well. So um, if you don't want to see in theaters, you can see it there uh, most likely later this month. But Snack Shack, guys, I'm looking forward to it, man. Like, I love that type of shit, you know? Just good, like, coming-of-age type movie f- for, you know, young folks. I love me some nostalgia, man. There's a yes. there's a, there's a song on Lil Dicky's new album that's all about his trials and tribulations. Like Going with, Gray? Girl. Is it Going Gray? Is that the song? It's the one where it's about all his, his issues with, like, girls in middle school yep. and high school and, like, Okay. Just because he, he and I are similar ages. So like Harrison the, Ab, maybe Harrison especially Ab, the yeah. especially the music video for it. I was just like, that was my growing up. Yeah. Nostalgia is nostalgia is important, man. It is. It is. Um, and also important to us over here is helping the IBT family out, guys. So let's go ahead, let's round out the program tonight with a little from the forum and, and take a couple questions over there. If you're up, stuck, think about what to do Here in between, we got advice for you Back and forth all day, trying to pick the play Let's hear what the boys here had to say Presented by the Fantasy Football Advice Network All right, from the forum is presented by the Fantasy Football Advice Network. This is a platform for fantasy footballers that combines apps like Discord, Patreon, Facebook, all into one platform that you can get the advice you need easily. Um, and also features a lot of great, uh, a lot of great features for both content creators and content consumers. And like one of the hardest parts, at least when starting out in this industry, is like. You don't really have a platform to post on. If you're new to the space, it's a great platform to post on. You can also download the app, join things like lead classifieds, group creator tools, and the forum. Hoob, I know you've been over there uh, surfing the streets and getting involved with the forum. What do you have to say about it? I mean, obviously, it's just like a healthy healthy alternative to Twitter. You can go on there. You can meet cool people, and like they're just going to give you real authentic advice that they would do. And like, unless they're Unless you're in leagues with them, then obviously you can't. Yeah. But 
Um, but no, overall, it's just it's great atmosphere. It's good vibes. And like I would recommend it to everybody to come join the community for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's get to uh, a couple questions here from our guy at the geezer. Uh, I'm guessing he's an older gentleman. Should you lock in a workhorse RB in the top four picks of 2024 redrafts? How do you feel about that, Scott? Are you reaching uh, or even considering a running back in your top four picks? Last week, I, I believe we were pick. I don't even know what I think we were pick four. And I, I think we ended up with a or pick three. Maybe we ended up with a Tyree kill. Um, how do you feel about a running back in that top, uh, group of, of draftees there? I mean, I'm still in redraft. I'm still down, you know, CMC. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I can get CMC in the top four. I'm taking CMC outside of him though. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see just the general redraft rankings as the summer or as the off season goes past him. You know, you've got Brees Hall, you've got Bijan, you've got Kyron Williams, you've yep. got, You've got you've, you've got running backs who I don't think there's a clear cut number two, um, and when with that being the case, uh, especially if it's you know half full point PPR, I'm I'm going receiver out after CMC in the top four. Who? How do you feel about it? I think that I'm becoming more and more of a, z- a zero RB person, but I feel like that's the way the league is going to. So like you have to just go with the times, like. Um, there's so many players that I would have burned myself on or I did burn myself on by investing in just because I was thinking that they're just going to have this huge opportunity this year, like a Najee Harris or a Nick Chubb or a Derrick Henry or whoever, you know, well, not necessarily Derrick Henry, more of an Austin Eckler, whoever, but like running backs more and more, you're just finding out that it's just becoming more and more of a split backfield. And if you can find some of those big volume guys, like your Amon Ross St. Brown's, your CD Lambs, like some of those wide receiver two threes that you can find at good values. I don't, I don't think that you can really plan mm-hmm. on a running back that early in the draft anymore. Yeah. CMC is the only one like, like I'm fine. I still put CMC kind of right in that top tier there with, with, uh, with lamb, with Hill, with Jefferson. So I'm fine. If, uh, if our guy, the geezer wants to go after someone like that, but um, like outside of that, like, I have Brees Hall right around 106 for me currently in my rankings. And he could like, I don't see him get any higher than that. I can only see him getting lower. So uh, I'm with you guys, you know, times are changing. We kind of have to stay, stay, stay prevalent to that. Um, another question from over there to on the forum to round us out tonight, who is this year's affordable rookies with top 24 upside? So we did see s- some guys who were pretty affordable in drafts. Jordan Addison last year was one of them. Devon Achan was another one. Um, who at least points per game wise were in, inside that top 24. Scott, hearing this question, is is there anyone that comes to mind? Maybe someone we saw around the combine that is at least going to be affordable in redraft circles that you could potentially recommend for our, our buddy over here on the network? Um, I mean, in redraft, I think if we're talking redraft. There's probably some of the players we've already covered are going to be not super unreasonably priced. I mean, we'll yeah. see. I mean, you know, neighbors, Harrison, those guys are going really high. Um, you know, but if we're talking more like way later in your draft guys that maybe some guys that with upside, we haven't discussed yet. Uh, one of the running backs I like is Marshawn Lloyd. Um, oh, he, had, he, had, he had huge fuck shoulders, bro. He had, he had a good combine. Um, he's a guy that could carve out a role. Um, I mean, honestly, you know, probably who knows if he'll even get drafted, but I, like I said, with Audric esteem, I'm not, I'm not cutting bait yet just because of that 40 time. But that 40 time is going to scare a lot of people because 40 times yeah. are, you know, cherished uh, yeah. in, in football. So he's he's another guy who, you know, and I mean, you can't just be like, well, Kyron Williams had a bad combine and he's good. Now everybody yeah. that bad combine is going to be good. You can't say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he kind of reminds me of that in a, a little bit in that I think the talent's there. I think he just had a, you know, he, he, he had a bad combine. So he's another one. Um, in the receivers, uh, I'm trying to think. Why don't Why don't you take a turn on this one while I think? Yeah, about it? I would say we we took him. I have like almost 100 percent best ball exposure to him right now, but it's early. Malachi Corley, he didn't perform at the combine here. Uh, he's going to save a lot for his pro day, it looks like. But kid out of Western Kentucky University, known as the Yak King, I think he's going to be very valuable around fantasy circles towards the later half of the year. So I think he has some top 24 upside in redraft circles. And also uh, someone we haven't talked a ton about here, 
on the program i feel like as of late um but but you know you guys know my love for him, man university of new hampshire's own dylan lobby th- threw up the you know suck these at the end of the at the end of the yeah, uh, r- running back drills i mean dude he looked smooth in those fucking pass catching drills i think he'll have a role immediately he's a great pass blogger he's a great pass catcher I think wherever he goes, even a day three pick, he could factor in and get on the field early. Who have your thoughts on any of the, the prospects? Scott and I mentioned anyone you have uh, for a guy, the geezer here, top 24 upside in redraft. I'll give you a really good educated guess, geezer, okay? So I'm going to steer away from Harrison and neighbors, actually, falling in top 24, their, their freshman year, their rookie year. Uh, I think the position that I'm going to look at or the draft pick, would be whoever the Jaguars pick, honestly. That's that's going to be the good one. You got Christian Kirk coming off an of injury this year. More than likely, Calvin Ridley's walking so that they can they can secure that second-round pick and only yep. trade the yep. third to Atlanta. Yep. So yep. that's a that's a team right there that I think that Trevor Lawrence is going to be looking for targets. So whether that's Roma Dunze or Brian Thomas Jr., I think that one of those guys could slide into that role and give you top 24 upside. I like it. I like it. Good projection there from you. Um, yeah, man, we, we got a lot of shit. We're going to be covering this off season guys. We're going to do kind of a free agency reaction next week. I think we're already there, dude. Like it's crazy to think that we're already there, but we'll, we'll do some reacting to free agency. Who of you and I are going to put our, uh, combine winners and losers on the website. We're going to have some more content coming for you guys over there and, and throughout the uh, off season here on the YouTube channel. You guys know where to find us. You can find Scott on Twitter at Munder, uh, Munder Difflin. You can find Hoove at HooveTube. You can find myself at, at Between underscore Seth FF. But really the easiest way to support us, guys, is come hang out with us here on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this type of content. Uh, we appreciate everyone who rode with us today. Great to, to chat up uh, about the Combine and what it means for fantasy football winners and losers. So we will catch you guys next week. Until then, be a good person. Have a great weekend. Be safe. And uh, until next time, keep it in between. Thank you.